Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. Many people today are living lives that fall short of what they truly desire. According to today's guest, Kimberly Friedmutter, we have the ability to design the life of our dreams and the power lies within us. Kimberly works with Hollywood A-listers, politicians, CEOs, and titans of industry to help them connect to their subconscious in order to get what they truly want out of life. According to Kimberly, everyone has the birthright to expect the exceptional. Kimberly is a board-certified master hypnotist, an NLP trainer, who has appeared on Entertainment Tonight, The Doctors, TLC, and CNN, among other media outlets. She is the author of the book, Subconscious Power, Use Your Inner Mind to Create the Life You've Always Wanted. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks. Nice to meet you, Joan. So, Kimberly, let's start off this conversation by talking about the subconscious mind. How does the subconscious mind differ from the conscious mind? So the conscious mind and the conscious part of us is our task maker and our calendar keeper and the part of us that makes our meetings and makes conscious choices and decisions, whereas the subconscious is the good part, (laughs) if you were to ask me. (laughs) I would say that that's the touchy-feely part. The part that does everything else, which is so much, if you think about it, all of your memories, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, um, what you plan to do with yourself, you know, everything that you could like focus on symbolism, morality, uh, like I said, faith and belief, everything that you, you know, finding lost items. I mean, simple things like practical things, but simple things like, um, Oh, gosh, finding great parking spaces, being led a certain way, your intrinsic value system, again, morality, anytime, you know, how you see like a, this is kind of a little fun exercise, you see a a peace sign, and what do you think? You think peace, and you think safety, and you think calm. Those are all uh, associations that are made in the subconscious. And so you can see how heavily burdened that part of our mind is, right? Mm -hmm. carries the weight for us, whereas the conscious mind just kind of says, okay, appointment at 12, better hop in your car and get there. So it's really, I think, fascinating that we we don't really focus, nor have people really focused so much on the subconscious mind up until now we've become so mindful. And you know, you've right. seen the shift, and especially since COVID, everybody's been you know, really trying to get in and see what makes us tick. And it is that part of the mind that's so unique and special. Well, and that's what's so interesting about what you're saying, because so many people that I work with are saying that, you know, we spend about 95% of the time in the subconscious mind and, and 5% in the conscious, and they're all telling us to learn to shift into being mindful and conscious. So tell us more about how the subconscious mind gets programmed. So you have inside of you an inner stenographer, and I liken it to a little eight-year-old child inside of you. And the reason I do this is because the subconscious is 100%, as I mentioned before, moral. It tells it like it is. It doesn't sugarcoat things. It really is the part of our mind that is childlike in the sense, if you remember when you were eight, and it doesn't even matter that it's exactly eight. Maybe you remember six. Maybe you remember 11. It doesn't really make a difference. It's that time period where the truth is just the truth. You say what you think. It's just before we get PC and learn to play well with others. And so we don't skew and we don't have an agenda and we don't really, we're very selfish. The subconscious mind is all about itself, which is what I love about the book because it's it's the most selfish book you'll ever buy. It's Mm -hmm. only about you, not your neighbor, not your family, none of that. But what happens is that little part of us, the eight-year-old, never sleeps. So you know that you dream, that's your subconscious. You know that you daydream, that's your subconscious. The subconscious runs your body. You don't think about it. It's all of those parts that are underneath, hence sub, 
subconscious underneath. It's like the screensaver. You know how your your computer or your laptop, you look at it and you see that it is. So that would be the conscious mind. And when it runs, it just runs. But there's all kinds of workings in the background. There's all kinds of mechanisms at play in the background. And that would be like what the subconscious is. And so I 100% believe that we're zoning in too much and we need to zone out. That's the big play here. Zoning out is where greatness comes from. If you look at history, people like Mozart were addicted to trance. They were addicted to hypnosis because that's where he would compose his operas from. That's where it's like a portal. Some people call it channeling. Other people call it inspiration. Whatever the term is for you, that's where those things come from. So when Johnny is looking out the window and you're trying to get his attention to come back in the room and stop daydreaming, leave him alone. He's in his great space there. That's his power place. Mm -hmm. So can you offer a few strategies? You just mentioned meditation, a a trance-like state. Are, Are there other ways that we can tap into this power? So meditation, a lot of people ask, and I appreciate you asking that, meditation is the opposite, basically, of hypnosis. They're similar in the, in the fact that they start the same. So I would say close your eyes and go within. And that going within is simply getting aligned. That's feeling the you inside of you where the noise is outside of you, right? You know the feeling. And from that point on with meditation, you're zoning in so that you're bringing, you're, you're focusing on your thought. And you're putting, I'm sorry, you're focusing on your breath and you're putting thoughts at bay. With hypnosis and trance, it's exactly the opposite. You're starting the same, close your eyes and go within, but you're zoning out. You're allowing all of those thoughts to just come flooding in, not to be confused with keeping them at bay. We're zoning out, so we're letting everything just come as it does. We're letting kind of like the universe take over. You're letting your thoughts skip around like little clouds on a bright, sunny day. You know, it's all of those it's all of those things that come to you. You know, when things come up from the subconscious, like, oh, you better call your aunt. Oh, you know, make sure that you remember to, you know, check the expiration date on the milk. All of those things are super important guidance tools. Those aren't just willy-nilly things not to pay attention to. How many times do you think, oh, I better call my aunt, and then all of a sudden you do think to make that phone call. You make it to the phone, make the call, and she says, oh, my gosh, I was just thinking about you. Or, oh, I'm so glad you called because your uncle needs to ask you something. Those are not for nothing. When, when I say get in touch with that subconscious, I am basically saying, do you want an easy life or do you want a more difficult life? Because when you tap in, it does the heavy lifting for you. It does that work for you. And I challenge anyone to take one week. I love this exercise. Just take a week and follow your impulses. It's the easiest thing you can do. If your impulse says to go online and buy the book, fantastic. But if it doesn't, I want you to follow that impulse all week long and see what kind of an easy week you have. We have this internal GPS. We have this guidance system. When we listen, it, it guides us and it leads us. Now, there's some people who are just mismatchers and they just want to struggle or swim upstream. They like that. They like the resistance. They like time under tension. That's, this book is not for that reader. Mm-hmm. This book is for the person who wants an easy life. I kid you not. I didn't always do this. I've done a thousand other things. But when I got to this and when I became a hypnotherapist and when I saw the transformation in my private practice of clients, I couldn't believe it. I was so wowed. And then Simon & Schuster asked me to write the book for them, which I did. It's been the best thing ever. It's, it's easy. It's fast. Nothing takes more than a few seconds to do. It's, it's the easiest way. You already have the mechanism. You have the workings. That's the beautiful thing about it. And sometimes women like to corner the market on intuition and gut instinct and all that. And we joke around with it, you know, women's instinct. But the truth is we all have it. And the truth is we come into this experience with it. And so it doesn't matter in age. My father's 91 and he's reading it and he's wowed. You know, these are conversations he and I have never really had. But in book form, he can read it and really, you know, get in touch with his subconscious. It doesn't matter if you're 10. I'd love to just tell you a couple of the lists that the book hit, which shows you the breadth of, because I say, if you have a brain, you're in the game. We all have this. You know, some people, oh, I don't feel that intuitive. Read the book. It's just that you're not tapping into it yet. It's all there. I mean, it's this valuable, valuable resource we have right in those 
you know, four to six square inches in our mind. So Kimberly, let me just ask you to back up for a moment. You, you write about six principles of subconscious power in your book, and you've touched on yeah. some of these, but can you just bring us through these six principles very briefly, just to give us an overview? Sure. You've got it. So the first principle is come into accountability. And this is about every protocol. You know, you can't go to, from point A to point B if we don't know where point A is. So it's just about getting really honest. You know, I'm a schmuck. I'm, I'm fantastic. Whatever your thing is, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. whatever your real accountability is, whatever you think about yourself, the missteps, you know, I say warts and all, all of it. That's, and, and by accountability, it's, you're not left writing letters. You're not calling anybody. It's really just self-inventory, super easy to do. Principle two is tap into your subconscious power. I guide you through this. We all have it. We've all felt those moments where you just knew you were right. You know, when you said, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Maybe you didn't listen, but you knew what you knew. And that's this part. Principle three is moving toward or away. Now, this is very interesting because people don't necessarily think about their trajectory. Where do you go? Do you fling yourself towards things because you're running away from something? Typically, like, you know, I look at people who move a lot and I say, oh, are you leaving that because you, you don't want that anymore? Or are you mindfully heading to something that you do want? This is a perspective exercise. Look at how you run your life. And this is, you know, all just, again, taking really great inventory. Principle four, judge thyself and thy neighbor. We've let our judgment slide. We're afraid to judge. We are afraid to, I guess, own our own ecology and own our own sense of agency. When I think, is this person good for me? There's a whole exercise in here to know when you meet people. Are they good for you in the short term, the midterm, or the long term? Is this project good for me? Should I change jobs? Is this location good for me? These are all things that you have inside of you in your internal mechanism. Principle five, give to get. Now, women love this one. You know, we're inherent givers, mothers especially. We give until we, we have no more. You must get. You must, must receive. There, there's a real vacuum in that with females and especially mothers. We're over givers. We exhaust ourselves. It's a symbiotic thing in the universe. You must get in order to give. Principle six, play big. We need everybody on board. We need everybody to be the best everybody we can be. When you do great, Joan, I do great. When I do great, someone else does great. All boats rise in high tide. This is that chapter. It's no time to be coy. It's no time to play small. It's no time to have excuses. It's got to be now. And when we roll up our sleeves and we put our nose to the grindstone, we can all get there. And it doesn't have to be hard. One of my big mantras is what if it's easy? And although that's not a principle, it's prevalent through the book. Mm -hmm. What if it's easy is you have two perspectives. It can be easy or it can be difficult. You choose and you'll be right either way. I choose easy. You know, there's time and time and time again and examples over examples in the book where simple things like, oh, during the recession, you know, a client wanted to sell their house. Oh, I, my husband says, no, it's going to be so difficult. Listen, put it on the market. See what happens. They didn't even have to do that. A lady walks by and says, oh, my gosh, I see the for sale sign. I've loved this house this whole time. What do you want for it? I want to buy this house. Everything can be as simple as one, two, three, if that's the perspective you come at it from. Things are going to be hard, of course, but you can make them also fun and feel easy. And, you know, I'm listening to you and everything that you've written about, it, it's what I intuitively do in my life. I have the same philosophy as you. Why do you need to make things so difficult? They're, they're not as challenging as people make them. Yes, and you, you hit the nail on the head because here's the thing. We have it in us, and you just touched on that, that you already automatically do this. This book is simply a manual, how to guide and work what you already have. You don't have to go out and buy anything. Again, it's not uh, laborious. I say it's fast, cheap, and easy. I love quick. I don't love journaling. Journaling is great for some, not great for others. I love just having it be right in my head, right in my thoughts. It's like the perfect, it feels so natural. Like you read the book and you go, oh my gosh, that's me. This story is me. I totally get this. And these hacks are as easy as we can do one um, right now if you'd like. It's so easy. I'd love to just demonstrate how quick it is. Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask it. you to share one or two of your favorite hacks. So that's great. Thank you. Yeah. So, okay. So what I love about this one is the, the broadness of it. 
it's got such breadth. So what happens is if you have a negative emotion, let's just say that you're angry, you're frustrated, you're jealous, you're annoyed, you're disturbed, you can't sleep, whatever that negative emotion is, anger, sadness, fear, hurt, guilt, it doesn't matter. Go ahead and focus on a point in front of you and look at that point. It can be anything. You can be driving, you can be reading, it doesn't matter. This is a this is a perfect holistic non-invasive exercise. Just stare at a point in front of you and allow your eyesight to diffuse into peripheral vision. So this means you're softening your focus. You're allowing your eyesight to move simultaneously to the left and to the right. And for listeners who have trouble attaining this, just put your hands in front of you and wiggle your fingers until you're bringing them to the sides of your vision and you can see both of them at the same time wiggling. So you can see how that feels. What happens when you go into peripheral vision is we can't think two thoughts at the same time. So when we're doing this exercise, it literally sucks out like a vacuum out that negative emotion. You can't connect to it anymore. And you can feel that. And you may even, if I watched your body do this, you, you may even straighten up. You may broaden your shoulders. You may relax your shoulders up and back and down. And you may feel better now because you can't access that negative emotion. This is fantastic when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't sleep. You don't have to have your eyes open to do this exercise. You can close your eyes if you want to practice this now. Close your eyes and imagine that focal point and then imagine bringing your eyes to periphery. You feel how that works? Mm -hmm. So easy. And you and you can't access. So if I associated you into a negative um, feeling or an emotion before we did this exercise, then you would feel that go away. It's easy, you know, excuse me, super easy to do with the negative emotion, you know, in mind, because that's when you want to use it. You want to use it at the beginning of a panic attack or anxiety attack or something like that. You really want to look at, at focusing on a point and spreading the, that eyesight into peripheral vision and then see where the emotion is and you'll see that you can't access it. This is great also for finding good parking spaces. We know how important that can be. <laughs> Kimberly, how long should we stay in this? How long did we need to keep this up? So you can live in it. I wouldn't perform surgery in it, but you can live in this state because what happens is it's also called the training state. So when you're reading, if you read in peripheral vision, you'll retain that information. It's also um, very much used for public speaking. People that go up to a podium or they're speaking at a microphone, they look out at the audience and they don't want to focus. And so that's one of the, the tips and tricks. You know, I don't know how many people are interested in public speaking, but mm -hmm. it helps alleviate fear, you know, what they say about it. <laughs> it's so scary. And I actually was hypnotized. The very first time I was hypnotized was hypnotized for fear of public speaking. So I know, I know the fear well. And um, I remember being afraid of walking across the stage in my heels. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh, my gosh, am I going to just slide right off the stage into the abyss, you know, of public speaking and, you know, all the fears that are associated with that. And so I sought out a hypnotherapist and she had a session with me and I fear no more, my friend, fear no more. <laughs> well, you know, Kimberly, I, I want to share a story with you because I think you'll get a kick out of this, but I think it's also important for our listeners. The first time that I was scheduled to be hypnotized, I had never done this. And I'm a real type A, you know, I need to approach everything intellectually. So my only experience with hypnotherapy had been those shows that I'd seen where someone would get up on stage and cluck like a chicken. And my greatest fear was that the person was going to slip something into my mind subliminally that I wouldn't be able to control. And so I spent the night before reading everything I could read on hypnotherapy, I was panicked going in because I didn't know what would happen. And I have to tell you, it was the best experience of my life. You are fully aware of everything that is going on at all times. No one is slipping anything into your mind. And it actually helped me heal from tremendous loss and grief and uh, grief from loss in my life. So I recommend that um, everyone does it at least once. It, it was a wonderful okay. experience. Well, what's neat about self-hypnosis is you're doing it to yourself. You know, right. first, first and foremost is just to clarify is that no one can make you do anything that you don't want to do, right. period, no matter how. You know, it's just not true. What's fun about stage show hypnosis, and as you know, I live in Las Vegas, and so I'm well aware of the shows <laughs> and all of that. Chris, An Chris Angel's a neighbor. And so what happens is what's funny about it is, you know, this is stage show hypnosis that you, you know, were afraid of. And again, it is stage show hypnosis. The other, the hypnosis I 
you know, participate in is clinical hypnosis. So big, big, big difference. Just a shift of perspective and a simple shift of how you think about things is always hypnosis. Just to show you how we're hypnotized, staring at a fireplace, mesmerized. Watching children kick a ball, mesmerized. Long stretches of highway where you don't really consciously think of getting from point A to point B, hypnotized. So all of these these moments in trance are just natural moments. We're naturally wired to do this because, again, the screensaver has to come on in order to give us reprieve. And so trance is the most natural state. You know that feeling right before, and I know I'm singing to the choir because you've had hypnosis, but for those of you who haven't, you know that little feeling before you fade off to sleep where everything's kind of perfect and you're in mm-hmm. that floaty space? Right. And then that same feeling when you start to come back up from sleep. All of that is trance. And, of course, there's different levels. My husband was hypnotized, and he laid on the couch, not by me, but by one of my colleagues. He laid on the couch with his hands behind his head with his baseball cap on. He didn't close his eyes. He just laid there and stared straight ahead, and he lost 60 pounds at the time. Um, He was going for weight loss, and it was about a 20-minute session, and it was the most fabulous thing for him. And he's very linear and analytical. He's an architect, and if it's not on the page, it's not on the stage, and he's numbers Mm -hmm. and lines. And, you know, just like you, approaching everything intellectually, and it worked beautifully for him. So you can't unring a bell like that. You know, when you're open to anything and flexible about anything like that, and it's obviously ecological. You know, we don't we don't worry about things that aren't ecological or, you know, somehow take your power away because your mind won't absorb that anyway. It just won't. It just knocks it right out of the out of play. So it's not even an issue. And Kimberly, one thing I want to make sure we get in before we run out of time. In today's age of COVID, everyone is concerned about trying to stay healthy. And There is a a mind-body connection. So how can all of this information play into us remaining as healthy as possible? If you keep the perspective that we're all doing the best we can, that's just a natural, that's actually a forgiveness perspective. And, And when you have the perspective of like what I like to call the God perspective, and you can call it whatever you want, but it's just where you're up high looking down. If you just imagine now closing your eyes, and going within, which is just getting settled and getting aligned. And imagine yourself floating up above the surface. So floating up, let's say, to 10,000 feet looking down. Let's just make it mid-height. So you're looking down and just imagine that everyone's doing the best they can now. Feel that feeling. Feel what it feels like to look down on us. So you don't see the entire planet. You're just high looking down. And we're all doing the best we can. And we're all going through the same thing. And then zoom up higher. I want you to see the planet. I want you to go astral. So go up high like stars and planets and look down at our planet. And I want you to feel the love that you have for that beautiful green and blue marble. And look at that marble and just know how long and how sturdy that marble is, how long that marble's been here, how long Mother Earth has survived, how many things Mother Earth has been through. And as you look at her, I want you to pour your love out, almost like out of a pitcher, like water onto the planet and pouring this love that you have for this planet and the people on it who inhabit it and the animals and just the the whole Earth itself. Feel the power of that connection. And as you start to float back down onto planet Earth and you start to go now through the atmosphere, down through the sky, through the clouds and into your town, into your home and seated in your home, in your chair or in your bed or wherever you want to land, carry that thought with you of how big systems are and how perfectly we fit in, how we just slot into the plan. We're a tiny part of the big, big plan and this big, powerful, beautiful plan. And see how you feel that the fear has disappeared now and how the pain has disappeared now and how the worry has disappeared now. And then slowly open your eyes and come back into the room. Those perspective shifts are so powerful because the truth is, is we're not just our experience. We're all our experience. We're part of a bigger picture. 
And any time you take that, what I like to call God perspective, and you zoom up high and you look down, is it does give you a different perspective. I don't know if you have a pet, but if you have a pet, lay on the floor sometime and get your eyes about four inches off the floor and look at the world from there. Like even just the pet's world, your bedroom, your office, whatever. <laughs> and it's fascinating the things you see. You might see little dust bunnies underneath the bed. You might see like, <laughs> the perspective. The perspective gives you a whole other world open to your, you know, your own experience. It's so much fun. The book is Subconscious Power. Use your inner mind to create the life you've always wanted. If you'd like to get more information about Kimberly and her work, you can visit KimberlyFriedmutter.com. Kimberly, in about 30 seconds or less, what's the takeaway? What would you like to leave our listeners with? What I would love to leave the listeners with is that you have everything you need all encapsulized in your mind. And if you have frustration, sadness, you feel depressed, you can't sleep, anger, annoyance, disturbance, especially now, please, please, please give yourself that reprieve because your own mechanism is waiting for you to use it and for you to appreciate it. And I urge you to please, please, please tap into your greatest resource that you yourself have and enjoy the ride because you can do that. It's it's there for the taking. It's all yours. Kimberly, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Joan. Nice to speak with you. This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.